Walker at Full Spectrum Laser, and welcome to Laser Talk Live. That's right, we're live here back once again at Full Spectrum Laser, ready to talk about all things laser. Thanks for tuning in to us uh, once again uh, here on Facebook Live. Uh, we got a great show today. We're talking about some pretty interesting things. Yeah, we're talking science. Science. There's a lot of science with lasers. And a lot of applications as well. Absolutely. So we're going to walk through um, a little bit of how uh, lasers work and then a little bit of what the different types of settings do in your laser that have different effects uh, as you run your jobs. Um, so I think uh, right away, I think the easiest thing to do is talk about how a CO2 tube works. You brought over a, uh, a laser tube for us to look at, right? Uh, no. I can grab one. Right, so um, we'll grab that laser tube real quick. So while um, Walker's grabbing that laser tube, um, basically inside of your glass CO2 laser tube, you have a very unique process happening. Um, an electrical source is applied to um, an inert gas within the laser tube, which actually excites it. Now that excited uh, gas is actually harnessed. The frequency uh, is harnessed and it exits out a diode. That uh, beam of light uh, then bounces off three mirrors and finds its way down to your material after it gets focused uh, with your focus lens. That's quite a bit of science that goes on um, as your uh, machine's working. Now, that's just for CO2 lasers. Now, uh, Charles has actually a great, um, uh, great graphic he has for fiber lasers, how it's a little bit different. A uh, fiber laser actually just has a, a, a source that uh, feeds through a, actually if you can make that the full size, Charles, so they can see it. Uh, they don't need to see this shiny face. Appreciate you, sir. As you can see here, uh, it's much different. It has a uh, solid state source, and actually the, um, that, uh, the fiber source travels along a, um, an optical uh, cable and then goes to a, uh, a galvo source where then the, uh, the mirrors bounce it down to uh, the material. Um, with the CO2, it's much different because the, uh, the um, focus area, the, your, uh, your head actually gets moved around in the gantry. So it's another big difference between using the uh, FDFC fiber lasers and the CO2 is that the uh, FDFC lasers have far fewer moving parts. Now, on this big bad boy right here, this is a how many watt laser tube, uh, Walker? This is 90 watt. I just ripped it out of my machine. This is not true. You just didn't run it. I think it's 120 watt. This is 120? Yeah, I think it's 120 watt. Oh, rocking it. Yeah. So this is the bad, big bad boy. Now this bad boy is about four feet long. Um, as you can see down at this end, has a diode. Then that's actually where the beam is going to exit. Look at how well that refocus. We just got a new yeah. camera, guys, and we're really impressed. I don't know if we're looking better, but we're definitely impressed with how well that auto focused in on that. Now that's a diode where the beam actually exits. So, and there's also a lens there. So when you're cleaning, that's a great point. Always remember that. There is also a lens there, so you can take a lens wipe and a Q-tip. Don't use the bare Q-tip, but use the lens wipe with then the Q-tip, Q -tip, right? And then put it in there and clean because so it can get in there. Absolutely. So that's and that's an easy place for um, dust and debris to collect, not just on a pro laser with a large tube like this, but also on a hobby laser. I clean that section out of my Hughes uh, Muse all the time. Yeah, and the Muse, it's a little difficult to get to, yeah, because it's in that tight little corner. Yeah, that's why the Q-tip's a good suggestion. Uh, like I said, you don't want to use the actual Q-tip uh, tip, but using that, or um, I actually just use the Allen wrench because it has a nice little L-turn on it. Uh -huh. So I'll stick um, a little bit, like I'll basically wad one of the um, um, cleaners on the end of it, mm -hmm. and then I'll stick another one flat, like on there, and then I'll use it to kind of just wipe yeah, off. Yeah, if, if it slips or breaks through. Yeah, you gotta, like, you gotta make sure you have that, like, uh, buffer area. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, the CO2 laser is interesting, too, because as you can see, there is a uh, inner tube and an outer tube. Now, these, uh, uh, I guess we call these uh, entry and exit points here for water, uh, actually cool the tube. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that, Walker? So cooling is going to make your uh, CO2 tube run more effectively. You want this about uh, room temperature and down. That's going to be your most effective uh, window of using this. Now, if you use it, your machine a little longer and it starts to warm up, you will see degrade in its power. Um, so keeping it cool with your water and chiller is ideal. Absolutely. Now, that um, spiral tube there is one of the ways the water flows around it. Now, what's important about the water flowing through tube at all times uh, is it helps keep the consistency of the uh, laser as well, right? So that you have the uh, same amount of power exiting the laser. Yeah, yeah. And always, if you tested a tube right at the output, it's going to be stronger than where it's coming out your laser head because it does degrade over time and that's why when you have a larger bed area it's going to be weaker 
in the lower right hand corner no matter what. Absolutely, because it's the farthest uh, the, the beam has to travel. Now, as we t talk about power and current, uh, those are two settings you use during uh, vector uh, marking and cutting. Uh, and they're much different. Um, a lot of people ask, you know, when do I change my current? When do I back off my current? Um, uh, what's the difference between power and current? Why is there even a power and current setting? Why isn't there just one slider? Well, um, the easiest way to think about it is um, power is literally um, a pulses. So um, power is actually the number of times the laser is, is pulsating instantaneously, thousands of times a second, and hitting your material. So almost like a jackhammer, how fast the jackhammer is pulsating. Now the current is actually how much power, or power is actually bad use word to use, uh, current is actually how much electricity or how much um, um, current is behind your uh, your pulse. So if you're at a hundred power but fifty uh, current, that means the pulse is going as fast as possible but only half the power is being applied. Whereas if you go hundred percent current but fifty pulse, half of the, or sorry, all the power is being applied but only half as many times it's going. You might ask, well, doesn't that kind of do the same thing or have a similar effect? Yeah. You'll see very similar effects if you go 50% power, 50% current, and switch them, or 50% power, 100% current, and then switch them. Um, you'll see very similar results. Um, the thing is, though, with current, uh, power affects, um, sorry, the current and power uh, will change the effect of how well you cut. So if I find a very close power setting, um, but it's, um, let's say I try to cut something at 35, like a birch wood at 35% power, and it's uh, getting through really good, but it's a little charred, it's a little burnt. Mm. Instead of backing down the power, I'll actually just back down the current. So there's a little bit less uh, juice going through at the point of attack, so there's a little bit less energy there. Um, where power, uh, you'd have less pulses, and I, I honestly don't think uh, that backing down, I think once you find the right power, the right number of pulses that you need, mm -hmm. I think that's kind of your spot. And then current's are the spot where you really kind of fine tune and dial it in. Yeah, and definitely dial it in. Like, I visualize it just to dumb it down a little bit, because it's like, you're saying all that, but it's hard to like visually apply that, right? So I think about it as like two knobs. So I'm gonna throw my power on, and then this is that little dialing which that current is. That it just like, it's really good for paper. Paper's a really good example because you don't want that charred edge on that little paper. So to reduce that char, uh, make it less dark, less brown, just play with that current a bit. So uh, just that second little dial, I feel like it's uh, good for tuning in. Absolutely. The, uh, the times I use vector uh, markings is when uh, current is the most uh, prevalent for me. So I want my vector mark to be just right. And honestly, I want to mark it as fast as possible with getting the mark that I'm looking for. So if going at 100% speed, I'm still getting a little bit too much of a mark on it, uh, I'll just start to back down the current uh, rather than take back, because usually your power at that point is down in the uh, you know, single digit range. Um, that's a big difference between uh, power and uh, current. Um, the other uh, bit we want to talk about is um, how um, the big difference between uh, CO2 and, um, and fiber lasers are, is the amount of maintenance involved. Uh, we talk about this a lot uh, about doing uh, tumblers and other such things where if all you were doing were, was engraving tumblers or other such things, that, uh, considering a, a fiber laser is, is really the way to go. But the other thing to consider, there's, there's so f much less um, maintenance to do on a fiber laser than there is on a CO2. Uh, there's no gantry system to worry about. Uh, there's really only the single lens to worry about keeping clean, which essentially stays clean. Like it, you're almost too far away from the item to ever have anything yeah. get on it. It's almost always immaculate. Um, and then the power supply and source just lasts 10 times longer than a CO2 ever could um, with the solid state stores running through uh, fiber optics. It's a, uh, it's a much, much different system. Uh, and then the speed thing, I think, is another thing that um, really makes a big difference. On the CO2, you can only pulse so many times per second, like your uh, pulse rate uh, is really controlled. On the fiber laser, it's through the roof. It's, a, it's such a big difference. That's why you're able to go so fast on those passes and why doing four passes sometimes is the same amount of time as doing one pass on uh, the CO2. And we're going to show a great example of that tomorrow, right? Absolutely. So our in the cut tomorrow, <coughs> we're actually going to do, uh, yesterday you saw a CO2 example on some coated material. Uh, then we're actually going to do the same design uh, using the fiber laser tomorrow on Thursday. So you're going to have a side-to-side uh, -side comparison. I think uh, Charles will even run the video a little bit side-by-side -side with the uh, yesterday's cut, uh, just kind of showing an example as we go. Looks like uh, Thomas Blackburn's uh, uh, on. How's it going, sir? Uh, Dennis uh, checking in. John and Jeanette uh, Dezel. And it looks like we have the birthday boy, Jim, Jim Robinson, Robinson checking Happy in. Birthday, Happy birthday, man. Jim. Uh, good to see you taking a few minutes out of your birthday to spend it here with us on uh, Laser Talk. Appreciate it, man. 
Jeff Hayes too. And Jeff Hayes checking in as well. Uh, good to see you on as well. Uh, Jeff, glad that um, link we just shared uh, helped out. That templates, uh, Walker showed that to me the other day. Uh, oh, we yeah. shared it on the Facebook. Great little link. If you haven't seen it, check out our Facebook page. It um, has nothing to do with us. Um, I actually don't even know the company that uh, does it's the page. Yeah, I, I, I was so overwhelmed by how awesome it was, I just had to share it. Basically, if you like making three-dimensional shapes um, at all, <laughs> Uh, this website has something for you. Uh, yeah. Check it out. It has a bunch of free templates, basically any kind of box uh, inserts. If you need um, packaging, um, uh, what, what, uh, and uh, even uh, lighting, like, like all kinds uh, of there's stuff. There's so much stuff in there. Like it's, uh, like it's almost too much <coughs> to start trying to list things because it's almost limitless. And the best part is, is you just put in the parameters that you want, the size of the box, the size of the insert, number of points, uh, depth, it's height, whatever, and it just makes the file for it's you. It's like maker case times infinity. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, check that out again on our Facebook page uh, <coughs> on the previous post today. Um, with the applications, uh, with the different uh, types of um, lasers, really... You're limited on the CO2 with how many th different things you uh, can engrave. Um, when you go into metal marking, mm -hmm. is really the big difference. Why do you see such a different, a big advantage over using the uh, fiber than a CO2 with metal marking? Because you can do metal marking with the CO2, right? Yeah, you can mark uh, coated metals, and then you can use Surmark. Well, Surmark has a couple different ways. Uh, we showed it on a previous video. It has the spray, and then also the rub-on. Rub-on tape, um, but it is expensive and timely. Absolutely. So you're adding a, a big process to uh, marking metal. Yeah, money and time, which is money as well. So when it comes to the fiber, it's so fast. Like, it's ridiculously fast. And if you want an amazing, like, output, it, it takes a couple of minutes. But if you want something on par with the CO2 and even better, it'll take seconds. Absolutely. Uh, if that's okay, seconds, like, it really counts when you're just throwing something in there a second. Throw yeah. something, you can... If it's, you know, under, uh, what is it, four by four inches, it will engrave that whole thing in a minute. Absolutely. Like, it's nuts. Absolutely. And I think if you think about it, if you're doing it at conventions, shows, any place else where you're doing uh, live engravings, we do, you know, when we do uh, phone engravings at trade shows, you can do maybe 100 phones a day if you're really pumping through. Mm -hmm. You can do thousands a day if you're using uh, the CO2. Now, I don't know if you have a, the demand for thousands, but when yeah, you're thinking about each phone can take mm -hmm. under a second. But if oh, it sorry, like under, a mi under a minute, yeah. under a second would be ridiculous. Oh, yeah, if you did the whole phone. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But really, just the initials and the size we do is seconds. It's yeah, five yeah. and six seconds. And yeah. if it was that fast, people would wait in line all day. Yeah. Like, it would be a huge line if it was just seconds. Like, oh, yeah, I'm 40 people behind, you know, I'll see you in 20, you know, whatever. Absolutely. Randall Lee, thanks so much for uh, tuning in, man. Uh, thanks for uh, spending some time with us again. Uh, always good to see you uh, tuning in. Um, now... Muse and Pro, um, they have d different size, uh, it's a much different uh, source between a 45 uh, and a 90 watt laser tube. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you see as the biggest differences uh, between users of uh, 45 watt lasers and 90 watt lasers? So usually it's the work size and the thickness. You brought an example of the 45. No, I I'm didn't. Ju I I'm, did just, I'm just kidding. Um, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. I was going to just um, steal one out of a machine again. Um, oh, for <laughs> there. Yeah, so the, um, with the 45 and 90 watt, um, really, they're, you might uh, inherently, maybe the American ways to think, oh, the 90 watt's always better. Yes. And for the most <laughs> part, it is. But uh, if you were doing paper invitations, would you want to use your 90 watt? I mean, you could. Would you but want to? I would rather use a 40 watt. Exactly. So your application is really dependent on the type of laser you need to use. So um, don't feel. I don't know, short sight at all, if 45 or 45 watt, la or 40 or 45 watt lasers, what you need to do uh, your, your job. I, I think application is the most driving decision making uh, factor when figuring out what kind of laser you want. Um, I, I don't think anything else should really be in play. Like, no. sure you have a certain amount of size, sure yeah. you have a budget, but <coughs> really what are you trying to do with it? Yeah, it's definitely application based. And there's kind of this thing, like if you have the money for a pro and you don't really, you want a laser, but you don't know what you're doing yet, I, you could go either way as well, because you could get started with a hobby, or you could get started with a pro and never outgrow it. Looks like we have a few more hellos from Facebook. Steve, uh, Parker Adams, uh, Nick Taft, uh, good to see you guys. Thanks for uh, tuning in. Uh, Steve, this might be 100, 100 shows in a row you've watched. I appreciate it, man. Uh, Steve, <laughs> uh, if there was a fan club, 
uh, <coughs> I know a few guys that would yeah, be on yeah. <coughs> right away, and we'd proudly have them. So uh, any of you guys that watch the show regularly, if you're ever in Las Vegas, please stop by, and if you can, come here on a Wednesday. Even if it's not a Wednesday, we'll shoot a little something that we can play on a Wednesday. Uh, we yeah. appreciate you guys always watching and uh, asking great questions. Uh, it really helps the show, and we're really glad to help other people by answering questions uh, on the show that may, they might not think to ask, or maybe they haven't come across yet. So then... Um, and we got a couple things I guess we can go through uh, real quick. We have the uh, the pre-recorded video Pro Laser Tube comparisons. Mm. Mm -hmm. Exciting. Charles, you want to cue that up, sir? We'll just stare at the screen until then. Okay, the blue steel. Blue steel? No, I don't think we got that. I think we tried that once on the fashion episode, and it oh, yeah. didn't exactly go. He, he, Having issues. It's okay. Um, a small technical issue, not a big deal. Um, so what we'll move to real quick is the weekly contest winner. We have a really Ooh, cool one this week. I, I like this really, one. really cool. So Joe Hangi, uh, what he, he has a friend who goes to baseball games, and every summer he tries to go th to a handful <coughs> more baseball games at different arenas around the U.S. So he made him this great board with little tacks. So every time he visits one of the stadiums from different major league baseball teams, he yeah. can put a tack in the board. So he's got the map. He's got all the teams. Check this bad boy out. It's really, really cool project. See, I'm not a sports guy, but I could see doing this for a concert for your favorite band as well. Favorite band, favorite venues, um, or just like having a travel board, uh, whether it be for, you know, global travels. Um, yes. Maybe you are someone who wants to like travel in and out of the, the 20 biggest airports in the world. Mm. And that was a big thing. If you know, I want to fly in and out of tw yeah. the 20 biggest airports. Um, that would be a fun thing to do. So it's not just sports. You can do fun things no, like this. No, I've been meaning to do just like a world map. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, marking every place you've been with the silly strings and stuff. Yeah. I've been wanting to do that. I need to do that. With your big uh, 45, uh, oh, sorry, 48-inch, uh, um, yeah. maybe consider doing the largest continent um, mm -hmm. as one piece and then sizing everything from there. From there. So just yeah. take up a whole wall. A whole wall, yeah. Just Massive. imagine the details of like the little cities and oh, stuff. All the little like islands you could add. Yeah, yeah you could do like. Forever to design, but it would be awesome. Well, you could go slowly. So you could yeah, start yeah. with like maybe you just add Hawaii first and then Guam and yeah. then like, you know, Channel Islands and other things that you just like kind of slowly build our uh, Pelagios be out. Because really, if you think about like Southeast Asia and in and around like uh, New Zealand and uh, Australia, there may a million islands. Yeah. Like, uh, is there a count even? Like, I don't even think you put a number on that. Like, there's so I many know. islands. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm doing that. All I'm right. doing that. Well, we'll hold Walker to that. We'll keep him updated, and we'll keep you guys updated as uh, Walker starts making that. And we can uh, always offer those files as well. That'd absolutely. Be awesome. uh, looks like we have a few more hello scroll stuff. Thanks so much for. Um, um, awesome, dude. Oh, it's too. oh, scroll stuff. Thanks for watching it. Yeah, you, uh, you just, I don't know if you caught it, but you won uh, the weekly contest. Uh, looking for uh, settings to raster cardstock. Now, mm. I raster cardstock when I'm doing, um, like sometimes I'll make uh, for my mom's uh, gifts. She has, uh, uh, what do you call packaging, basically. So mm. like they're basically little tags. And I'll do a little raster on there and then cut the tag out in the shape of her uh, little business logo. Um, honestly, you, you kind of got to find, I notice even the different colors of cardstock raster a little differently. It's very, very delicate because you're actually really bleaching a little bit of it um, to give it that color. So uh, when you're engraving like a light color cardstock, uh, the little bit of burn that you're able to leave mm. is actually, in my opinion, kind of going a little too far. Like you're yeah. actually, you can almost see through it at that point. You're taking a little, a little bit too much of the paper away. But when you have colored cardstock, you can kind of bleach away the top layer with a little bit lighter settings and really give it a cool look. It always looks a little brown, though, right? Just a little A little off. brown, because it's, um, I mean, it's like bleaching out. So yeah. you're, like, you're removing the color. So let's say you put, like, blue cardstock in. As you mark it, um, you can get it more whitish looking mm -hmm. than you would think. And then it'll, you know, a little bit more power, and obviously it'll get a little dark again. Um, what's your favorite color to engrave? Um, the things actually, the, uh, the colors I find that work best are actually the darkest colors. So black, so whatever has the most amount of ink mm -hmm. in the paper actually engraves the best. So blacks, dark reds, blues work great. The things I don't have any luck on are all my mom's favorite colors. She wants yellow, she wants yeah. uh, like light greens, light blues, like all, all like the pretty pastel colors. None of them work good. I got to always like do something darker and then <coughs> engrave away. Well, I know you you engrave paper a lot, which when you showed me that, I was like, who engraves paper? Like, yeah, and honestly, if we're, it's not necessarily efficient. Like, if you're engraving, yeah. like, it's not the most efficient way to do paper. Um, it's just kind of neat it's to do. Yeah, it's, it's a more of a novelty do, thing. You like, can do it. Exactly. Like, 
uh, I'm not like I'm making hundreds of these th for my mom. She makes like you know she sells like maybe ten of these things a year. It's not like yeah. a, a ton. So to do ten of them is is not a big deal. And you can do some neat things when you engrave on paper. And there's a little bit of the wow factor when you get a tag. Whether it's like sometimes I'll do wooden tags for her or other things. Yeah. But like a little bit of the wow factor when you grab the tag and there's like a little something impressive to it. Mm -hmm. So you tend to want to spend a little bit more. Um, oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. So if you're making any product at all. Um, I mean, a strong suggestion: make your own packaging, your own like your own branding, your own tags, everything. everything. Make like, everything. Absolutely. The um, even if you don't feel like you know manufacturing the tags, like I think you can get packs of tags off Amazon or maybe even at Joann's for almost nothing. It's you almost wonder how they can cut them so inexpensive and I sell know. them. Like some of the laser cut things I see at Joann's, I just wonder like. Okay, they must have a factory with 400 lasers in there. And the biggest lasers, the fastest lasers. Absolutely, like. just pumping them out because I, I, it's, it's impressive to see some of the prices they can sell them for at Joann's. Uh, Parker Adams has a quick question. Um, how do I remove the bottom of a fifth gen laser? That's a great question. So there's a handful of screws on there. I believe it's, uh, I want to say 16 screws all the way around the bottom. And you just simply with an Allen, ha uh, Allen key, just remove them. Now that, uh, what it came with your Muse, if it didn't, you can get a standard size uh, metric set of uh, uh, Allen wrenches and one of those smaller ones, I want to say it's an M3. M3. I think it's an M3 screw, yeah. So if you have that M3 uh, uh, screw head, uh, that's the easiest way to do it. I suggest using a power screw because there are 16 of them, they're a little bit longer than you think, and after about the fourth yeah. one, you're pretty tired of removing these little screws. So uh, grab a little power drill and just yes. pop those out real quick. That would be my suggestion to That's you. That's a great suggestion. Yeah. Because the first time you, you you set the machine on its side, and then you're like, yeah, and then you, you it is way longer than you think, and you're sitting there. Yeah, absolutely. And then the best way to do it is to uh, tip the machine back so that the laser tube is at the back and at the ground. Like you don't want to tip it upwards so the laser tube uh, is up high. You want to keep that yeah. as low to the ground as possible, or tip it towards the side with the controller. And always make sure that your gantry mm -hmm. is all the way back when you tip it back. Absolutely. You don't. You gantry banging around yeah I actually when I removed my floor I put in this is not like I you can do whatever you want I took a zip tie and just very loosely kept it up there it wasn't like tight it wasn't like mm -hmm. secure it was just enough so it wasn't sliding around when I held it held up and I just cut it off when I was done yeah. I just happened to have them sitting there they were handy uh, it's an easy thing to do I've also seen people just take a little bit of their foam from in the box and stick it in there real quick That's just good. so nothing slides around looks like Jim's got a quick question on Facebook uh, Jim Robinson asks any thoughts about adding um, what are we? Uh, DXF. Oh, DXF and CDR file import for RE3, Jim. Absolutely. So, um, our version 1.8 release will have a handful of uh, updates as well. Like one of the big things software is working on is including and uh, increasing our native file formats that RE3 takes. Uh, and the next on the line are actually DXF files uh, that we'll be working on. Uh, CDR files. Uh, was that the other one? Yeah, yeah. Uh, those are Corel Draw files. Honestly, Corel Draw is the bane of my existence. Um, it's uh, yeah. it, it's it's a poor program for f for laser design. Uh, I know there's 12% of the population of laser users out there that will argue with me, like vigorously, and everyone that owns the Log will tell me I'm crazy. Uh, but I, every time someone has a problem with an SVG file, I have them send it to me, and they're like, "Oh, it's a Corel file," and I was like, "Ah, well." Yeah. Yeah, I, I have that same thing. Uh, I, I never used Corel Draw. Like I remember. Well, I did in 1997 <laughs> uh, when I first learned how to I, uh, arrange things on a computer for graphic design. Yeah, yeah. I was helping my dad do uh, advertisements for um, their uh, placemats yeah. uh, at restaurants. You sit down, you have placemats with all the small town advertisement on it. I was gonna say, yeah, that is definitely like. I wanted to be nice, but yeah, oh, it's I've very, <laughs> it's very dated uh, software. I, like I remember being very young and thinking this isn't intuitive. No, like, th it was not very good in '97, and <laughs> I, I like I, I it's a very like similar opinion right the, now. The people who created it have just like held on. Held on, oh, tooth like, and nail, just like this is what we are, and we will not be anything else. Yeah, and that's crazy. cool. And yeah. uh, like I said, those twelve percent of people that that use it. We we probably um, lost some. Yeah. Uh, some yeah, well like guys. Yeah, one of like our like we usually have about uh, ten viewers, so yeah. one of them just they're just know, like just I'm done with we're those done guys. full spectrum lasers <laughs> over. Not talking to those guys anymore. Uh, but even with all that said, we are still working on CDR files being able to input <laughs> into yeah. RE3. So uh, even the bane of our existence, we're still working on it. Um, just uh, with DXF files and CDR files, you have to imagine those files are very specific to the programs that they work with. So um, DXF and DDW, uh, DWG files are, you know, all AutoCAD. Like that's mm -hmm. for AutoCAD, CAD, that's CAD. a CAD, you know, that's, that's a CAD uh, language. 
It's done a little differently in different files, uh, but it's it's still just a like SVGs are. Um, it's just code. So uh, breaking down how every single program and every single like uh, possibility of code is going to enter wow. RE3 is a lot to go through. Um, a good way to check though, if you can load a file into uh, Inkscape, you can probably load it into RE3. So if you ever have a question or if you ever wonder, uh, that's usually the barometer we go by as far as what we can get into the machine. Um, looks like we have one more question from the uh, from the week coming in. Oh no! It looks like we have a handful of questions coming in. Gil, 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 Gil. What's up, Gil? What's up, Gil Mayron? If you're out there watching, um, in, this is Gil. Is from Tennessee. So Gil, if you moved to Tennessee, what's up, Gil? Still. Um, but in your opinion, what is the most difficult material to work with using a 40 watt CO2 laser? Oh, I know mine. Yeah, yeah. Let's go. You own a 40 watt laser. 45 40, watt line. 45, there we go. I got the upgrade, yeah. So 45 watt, I don't like glue. So anything that has glue in it, I'm not a fan of. MDF, top of the list, oh, hands down. That's a good I one. don't like MDF. I don't want to cut MDF. I don't want to engrave it. I don't want to use it. I'll avoid it at all costs. If it's the only thing available, perhaps I'll consider it, but I'll usually just wait. Uh, next would be, very close second, would be like cheap, inexpensive, three mil plywood. Uh -huh. So anything that has a lot of glue holding together layers of, if it's cheap and cheaply made, i.e. if it's bowing really badly, if it feels kind of thin and crackly, if there's a layer of MDF in that ply, ugh, I don't want to, I don't have anything to do with it. So that would be my two most difficult things to work That's with great. Uh, easily. That's great. I totally agree with the MDF, but I have been so fed up with MDF that I just don't even consider it. <laughs> yeah, I don't use it. Yeah. Um, so the stuff that I think for 40 watt is leather, because I'm always excited to make something leather. And sometimes you get some weird fibrous leather that's just like, it's uh, so thin, and for some reason, it just doesn't cut well. So here's my secret with leather. Leather. Real quick, though, Doug Williams, what's up, man? Thanks for tuning <laughs> in. Just had a quick, uh, it's a, but leather, um, I cut leather all the time. Like I make those yeah, yeah, little uh, wallets with it. Uh -huh. the, uh, the leather, in my opinion, it was a 45 watt, it's about the second pass. Mm -hmm. You're cutting leather with a 45 watt, I agree. I almost didn't want to deal with like dialing it in. Like I was like, oh, it's like taking like, it absorbs a ton of energy. So if you have too much power, it really starts to crither and like mm -hmm. gets all gross. If it's not enough energy, like you said, it's just two fibers and it kind of ruins it when you pop it out. So you have to like end up going back over with a lighter or a torch or something. So it gets all the, uh, yeah, yeah. it's, it's uh, and then the smell is just, ugh. but I'll be honest with you. Here's my, t the two big things. Like one, the second pass is the biggest thing. And then two, it's about getting over that leather quick. You don't want to spend time. Mm -hmm. You want to keep that speed up on the leather. So keep the speed up. And then honestly, like if you're about through on that first pass, that second pass, if you keep the same speed, you don't have to be like most of the way through on the first pass and have a second pass to clean it up. You can yeah. think about it doing it like I'm going to do this in two cuts. Like this is I'm purposely going to do two passes on the thing. Um, to me, that's the secret of the 45 watt. Yeah, I agree. It's a little difficult to work with 40. And the only times I'm wishing I had like a bit better with a big 90 watt or 120 watt laser mm -hmm. is when I pull out the big leather and I was like, ugh, I don't want to cut this down to 20 yeah, by 12. Cut and I can cut it out. Then I got to put, and then second I mean, pass. I still have to cut it. I just have to cut it in 40 by <laughs> six <laughs> by four foot by three foot yeah, sheets. Yeah. So a little bit easier. Uh, looks like we have uh, Jim's asking. Says uh, cork is difficult for uh, for Jim. I was looking if we have any suggestions. Now, cork's another one of those things. I'll be honest with you, Jim. It's got glue in it. Um, like now, if you have true actual, this is cork. You'll notice you'll have far fewer problems. Like the quality of cork is a big deal. Uh, cork right. comes from a very specific uh, wood, right? Uh, yeah, it's a wood. It, uh, Every time I look at it, I think it's the weirdest stuff ever, and I'm like, this comes from a tree. Yeah, this comes from, right. So quality of the cork is a big thing, but two, um, kind of finding uh, finding a dialing point. Now, if you're cutting, uh, cutting cork is a little bit more difficult, mostly because it kind of has a leather rule that like uh, you're hitting different inconsistent spots as you go across yeah, it. a lot of variables in it. So multiple paths for cutting and go into it thinking that's what you're going to do, not as a backup plan, like, nope, I'm doing this with two passes and that's mm -hmm. exactly how I plan on doing it. That way your first pass can be a little lighter. Um, I've done cork uh, coasters before, uh, mm -hmm. like with the No problem rastering. Oh, no, rastering, it's uh, really easy to raster, um, especially with the 45 watt, you can't really overpower that too much. Um, what I've noticed, though, with the cork is 
sometimes you won't get a very uh, sharp image on the raster. Mm -hmm. I'll do a, and this is for solid fill rasters only. Uh, and I, again, I don't think you could do a dithered raster on a cork uh, very well at all. Yeah, yeah. But with the solid fill rasters, run the edge of that rastered area with the uh, vector line. So uh, make sure, of course, oh, you yeah. have to do this with a vectorized uh, file, but as long as you have a vector line on the outside of your, like, let's say you have like a, a logo, like the FSL logo, like running along the outside of each one of those lines with the, uh, as a vector trace, if you will, mm -hmm. very lightly, crisps up all the lines. Uh, I noticed the outside edge of the state of Michigan, that's what I did for my parents, is like a little gift for their new, uh, like, sitting room. Mm -hmm. I made some coasters out of cork. They were already pre-cut. All I do is put like the Michigan uh, state of Michigan on them for them. Yeah, <coughs> super easy. But I did notice it like not super fit, like not high fidelity on the edge. Like, and each one looked a little bit. I don't say grosser, but like there was no consi like they're all they're all bad, and none of them were bad the same way. Like I couldn't like put yeah, a finger yeah. on like why it wasn't coming out. And I just tried it once, just running a vector afterwards, and <laughs> such a cleanup job. I mean, oh, made I the bet. biggest difference. Yeah. Yeah, cork has a lot of up and down, so I can see that. Not only up and down, but like just consistency of the density. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The little particles. Looks like we have uh, Betsy asking from Idaho. Uh, Walker, besides the laser tube, are there any other parts for the Muse that are considered consumables? And I'll eventually need to replace them. So uh, basically, Betsy's asking outside of the tube, what else would you have to look to replace? I would say there's no real consumables, but eventually you will have to replace your belts and your wheels if you run it a lot. You could you uh, also have lenses. That's a oh consumable yeah, product. Le lenses and mirrors. Absolutely. So uh, as long as you keep those nice and clean, you can avoid that for a very long time, though. Absolutely. Uh, really, with everything with the laser, uh, the amount of maintenance, the amount of care you put into it will really increase the amount of output you get from it. So like I said, I say this all the time, but you can't clean your optics enough. You can't go down and clean off your mirror enough. You can't clean your mirrors enough. Uh, Unless you you're improperly cleaning them. And, and then, then you're just, then just damaging it. Yeah. Uh, but taking just that two minutes to clean off your optics, and I try to do it like when the machine's starting up. So mm -hmm. first thing I do is I pop out the lens, mm -hmm. then I power the machine on. And as the machine's powering on, I'm getting the lens ready. And then I try to be real slick and pop it on before the, the yeah, entry yeah. moves, but you know, don't risk that. Uh, once that's on, then I go through and I just quickly with the same uh, uh, wipe, go through and touch up the mirrors real quick, and then the diode, it, again, the diode is somewhat protected and the, the draw from the exhaust doesn't really go that way, but I'll still go in there, like I said, with the Allen wrench every two or three times yeah, yeah. and just get the little bit of gunk that builds up in there. It's usually not a lot. You can see it on the wipe, but yeah, it's yeah. enough to get, a, get in there and get it out. And you, you don't want that little tiny bit of debris burning on your lens or mirror. Absolutely. That's another big thing. Yeah. Over time, that would just get so bad that you need to replace it. Absolutely. Uh, then looks like uh, we got one question coming in from California for you, Walker. Uh, can I engrave directly on stained and finished wood, or should I remove the stain and finish first? That's actually a great question. Yeah, so I do furniture pieces all the time, and they're most of the time old. Yeah. Uh, and they have, you know, the thick lacquer and the thick stain, just all, like, all that, and mm. I just engrave on top of it. But you will notice that what comes from that will be like a yellow you know, around your raster. You can clean that up, can't you? Yeah, just clean it right up. You yeah. can use a solvent or just soap and water. And then I like to go over it with a clear coat again and kind of blend that into the already existing clear coat, and that's how I do it. Absolutely. Now, a uh, thing to consider is uh, when you have it uh, stained and a protective coating on it already and you're engraving it, you're actually, that's protected wood. Mm -hmm. So uh, the only thing that's really going to get on there is a little bit of the burn off from those chemicals that are on the wood. Not much risk there as far as damaging uh, the wood. Uh, I wouldn't really consider that something that you'd have to like look out for um, by any means. No, the only thing I, that comes off the top of my head is the chemicals, you know, inside of that lacquer from the 40s. If it's an old piece, Absolutely. who knows what's in there? Yep. Um, but yeah. Yeah, that's probably the only thing to worry about is is that. But um, mo I mean, the MSDS on most most yeah, yeah. current. It, unless you're in California, then you can't do anything. You can't own a laser in California. Uh, that question was from Carmen in El Toro, California. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. So, <coughs> Carmen, no. we're sorry for that uh, ill-timed and California terrible has joke. California so much rules. So um, much rules. As a former Californian and someone who loves the state, um, I, love I apologize for Walker. It's the land of no. It's the land of no. Again, I apologize <laughs> for Walker and his mis so many misinfor California. misinformed uh, political rant he's going on here. Misinformed? Um, you can't, like, spray paints. They're, like, Jody so in Douglasville, <laughs> Georgia. 
uh, all right, asks, all right. um, am I allowed to make and sell the projects you post on your website, or are they copyrighted in some way? It's actually a great question. We get this a handful of times privately in messages. So every week uh, we have a project that we put up on uh, our website for free. Uh, they can use it or in the RE3 uh, bin formats, uh, and then they're for use for our customers, totally for free. And what we're going to ask here is like, if they take them, they make them, they make them their own. So if they make like some, uh, what did we make last week? We made the, uh, the yeah. dog holder. Yeah, yeah. So this yeah. is, I could see this being sold at mom and pop's veterinarian plots all the time. So could I physically take this walker and go sell it? Please do. Please do, right? Yeah. Exactly. Like we'd, we'd encourage, we'd <coughs> make it your own, add to it. I yeah. love to see somebody take a project and it, even just make the project makes me feel good. But if they make it their own, and especially if they're selling it and making money with a project that we've come up with, like Absolutely. I think that's awesome. Amazing, right? Now we actually have some projects that we're working on for this Friday's in the build, right? And Charles, we have a brand new, uh, I, what, what would we call this? We need to figure out a, a neat, a bird's eye view of this, whatever, like a crystallia yeah. view. Yeah. Of, of what's going on here. So these are the projects we're working on this week. Now, what do we got here, Walker? So we're doing makerspace signs. So if you have a makerspace, slower. oh, slower. If you have a makerspace, then uh, we have all these signs for you. So if you got the attention, laser use. And what's cool about these is you can scale them as big as you want, as small as you want. <laughs> and then uh, we have our materials and settings. So this is just an easy sign you can put up next to your laser so you can keep track of uh, what type of material you're using and what settings you have. Yeah. Then a few different warning signs for uh, laser in use in the area and a quick uh, polite reminder that, you know, the machine's not brain, but you have brain. <laughs> you use brain. Machine have no brain. And then, uh, then what's you got here? A setup, like a startup checklist. Oh. So you could have this in your makerspace or your school, and uh, it Hold just has a little, uh, you know, go through all these steps and then it has a little tech support at the bottom you might want to contact them if uh, your steps aren't working you know so this is a great little sign you can put up next to your laser in your school or your maker space and has just a quick startup checklist and then like you said down at the bottom what a good idea walker putting Thank that support you. right there and then uh, another checklist you did here uh, what's on this one so this is safety first never leave your machine unattended while it is operating blah 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 and it just hold it still and i'll move the camera and it will just uh you know these i can see just being on the back wall where your laser sits in your school or uh, maker space just uh for everybody's information now Absolutely. we have tests you know, uh, the laser certifications that go over all this safety stuff as well. Um, but it's always good to have that tangible in the space area. Absolutely. Then you did a neat little uh, uh, sign in sheet, right? So maker spaces can have people sign up for who is using laser next and whatnot, right? Yeah, and you can have your times on there, whatever you want. Uh, and this is made with the Romark whiteboard, which is plastic, but they also sell whiteboard at Lowe's that Absolutely. you can cut. It's got wood or uh, MDF backing. Absolutely. So, like I said, that was our project from last week. You can go and make, and then this week we'll have some of these cool signs that we'll make with Walker on the uh, in the cut, or sorry, uh, the one hour build. Looks like we had a question coming in from uh, Thomas. Is there a free file for the shelves behind you? Uh, the shelves behind us. So, I think. Uh, I think not, but I know we have this file. Um, what's beautiful, though, is if you wanted to make one of these shelves, I think that link that we just put on our Facebook page would probably help you do this. Um, this is basically just a notched box, uh, Mod you know, modded out for uh, shelf use. So uh, if you look at the edges here, and maybe we'll, I don't think any of these can come off really easy. They're all screwed no. in, but uh, we'll pop one off for next week, and I'll tell you what, uh, between uh, now and next week, I know this file exists someplace on one of our computers. Uh, we'll if find that, it. It'll take minutes to yeah, remake. Yeah, uh, we'll throw it out there. Uh, so look for that uh, next week. Uh, maybe we'll do that as a project for next week. Uh, I like that. Yes. Shelf? Yeah, uh, I may want to do a few different iterations of it. Maybe some yeah. candle holders, some shelves. Maybe, some yeah, like. something fancy, something not fancy. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, look for that uh, file next week uh, for one-hour build, just like that. I like that. All right, cool. Uh, anything else from the Book of Faces, Scott? Yeah. Looks like we're clean there. Uh, appreciate you spending the time with us uh, this week, once again, here at Full Spectrum Laser in beautiful, extremely, extremely hot yeah. Las Vegas, Nevada. I don't know where it is you are watching this from, but it's a hundred and... 30, no, 113 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> Just feels it feels like 131. Uh, 113 degrees here now. Um, I think when I get into my car, uh, when I go home, it says 120 something from just like the sun beating on yeah, it. Yeah, uh, it cools down. Like your car gets going and yeah. then it's like 
drops to 113. Like, oh. <laughs> it drops a whole seven degrees, yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Um, what's great is most people's air conditioning can only do about a 20, 25 degree tilt. So if you can imagine, all of our homes are about 85, 90 degrees. Uh, our dogs love it. It feels it's, great. It's so good. It's so nice <laughs> to sleep in. I'll tell you, waking up in 113 degree weather. Uh, well, the thing about uh, like Nevada, Las Vegas. It's Virginia, a dry heat, right? It's a dry heat. No, no it's but it, the worst. It's awfully hot for three months, and then the rest of the time it's, it's pretty, pretty great. Good. Yeah, so. it's pretty great. It's really like uh, right now is kind of our winter, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah. It's like yeah. we don't want to do anything. Like right we don't want to be outside. No. Everyone's like, it's so beautiful, it's so sunny. It's like, no, that hurts. Like that's. I know, like all the motorcycle guys back east, they like work on their motorcycles during the winter. Th yeah. Here I work on it during the, s the summer because I don't want to be outside. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So like our garage time is actually in the uh, uh, in the other time of the year. Looks like we have uh, Tom Sherwood checking in. Uh, caught you on the last part here. Appreciate you uh, watching with us, Tom. Uh, I think that's all the time we have for this week, though. Yeah. So tomorrow we have the comparison of the uh, in the cut, which will be a straight comparison from the CO2 engraving we did on Tuesday. So you can see a fiber comparison of the same exact file, uh, same exact uh, size. Exact everything. Everything's exactly the same, same material, everything. Except mm -hmm. we're going to do it on the uh, fiber, so you can kind of see the difference between the engraving speed and quality. Uh, then one hour build, like I said, we have these great projects that Walker made again this week, including this brain, which I just love this one. This one's like so smart. One yeah, it looks so clean. It's such a good project. Uh, Walker came up with some great ones. Um, all these signs that were so useful. Like, I mean, really, there's no makerspace or EDU space that couldn't just use one of these signs. Yeah, uh, they're the, I mean, the engraving takes an hour on that one. It's oh, on the bigger one? Yeah, it's fairly long, but it's the whole size of the Muse. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a, and, uh, I didn't even I, notice it. That is pretty big. That This was uh, a Muse? Yeah. Wow, that's 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 pretty impressive. And, that's pretty big. And uh, I think this would be a great first project. Like if you're setting up your maker space, it is large, but it's a, you'll learn a lot from how long the engraving is and realistic expectations. Absolutely. And then and I mean really, uh, especially if you're a maker space, what a great thing to to run off because you don't have to do this on this like we have this is some really nice fancy material we have here from Romark. This has a white back. This is actually acrylic. Uh, this uh, with wood grain on it, it's terrific. But uh, you can just do this on wood. You can do this on anything. cardstock. All these projects yeah. you can scale and put on anything. That's uh, probably the best part about uh, this week's projects. Is really like no material uh, necessary. You can use whatever you have in the house. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, or whatever you have in the makerspace, because there's one thing makerspace has a lot of, it's extra material laying random around. Material. So go grab some of that random material, throw some safety signs up, some materials, and really, uh, this, uh, this sign in sheet, whoops, this, yeah, whatever. Breaking stuff. Uh, this one for the Muse, well, Walker's set this up for a magnet so it can uh, stick right in the front of the machine. You can use this for any machine, not just a laser, not just well, one of our I lasers. I actually made a pro one too. Absolutely. So you can use it for pro machines, you can use it for your CNC's, your, what else is that the makerspaces people always get backed up 3D on? 3D printers. 3D printers always get backed up in the makerspaces. Uh, the CNC's, uh, oh, the, uh, the router and the, um, uh, like the, uh, what do you call it, the, um, uh, it's kind of like the big sander, but uh, uh, you can plane things on it. Uh, the planer, I think it's called the planer. Yeah. Is that what it's called? The planer always backed up on the one right over here on uh, Sunset. Uh, so this sign could be used on any of those big things. Um, I think that's all we have for this week oh, then. We're not going to talk anymore? What's that? No, I'm kidding. What's that? We're not going to talk anymore? I thought you were going to talk now. Oh. I've been no. talking too much. Okay. This, are we? No. Are we, is it? Is it? Okay. 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 All right. So we just had a small meeting. Sorry about that. All right. So that's all we have for this week. Yeah, we're good. All right. <laughs> we'll uh, have some more uh, next week on Laser Truck. Uh, next, we're going to do a few things uh, concerning the Pro uh, upgrade. We actually have a few things to disclose and show you with the. Uh, the new touchscreen, which is actually another thing that will be coming out in the Muse 1.8 release, is a LCD screen upgrade, which is a pretty big deal. A few functionality upgrades there, but we'll talk about that next week and a few other things. So tune in tomorrow to see our uh, In the Cut uh, live laser job comparison. Friday with Walker as uh, him and Scott make uh, these great signs for your maker spaces. And next week on Laser Talk here live at 4 p.m. every Wednesday, uh, full spectrum laser. Uh, thanks for tuning in, and until next time, keep making.